every coin in your pocket survived extremes during production that would destroy most objects. Furnaces hot enough to melt glass, pressures that could flatten cars. These ancient feeling discs remain oddly essential for your daily life, from feeding parking meters and grabbing a cold Coke from vending machines. The strangest part? Each penny costs more to make than what it's worth. It all starts here at the U.S. Mint with these giant metal coils stretching 1,500 feet, the length of four football fields. They come in different colors because the coins they'll be turned into have different metallic formulas. The coils are taken off the shelves and put onto these turbines, which uncoil them slowly and feed them into this pressing machine. There needs to be a human specialist nearby to finish that process, though. These sheets can be very stubborn. Fortunately, the pressing machine is powerful enough to handle them easily once they go in. The Mint describes it as something like a cookie cutter. It can pump out 14,000 of these blank coins every minute. The Mint workers know they're coming because the machine makes this fun little noise as they get pumped out by the bucket load. But that's not the only thing it's pumping out. On the other side of the machine, these gigantic heaps of oddly shaped metal pieces are piling up in equally imposing bins. There are even people raking them, as if they were leaves falling off the trees in autumn. The Mint calls it webbing, and it will all be shredded and recycled. The blank discs have now taken shape, but the coins haven't reached their final size yet. They have the same thickness as a finished coin, but the diameter is slightly different. That will get taken care of later. For now, they're about to take a harsh journey through fire and very special water. The furnace gets prepared. Elsewhere, the tanks full of this unique, slippery water are ready. It's time for annealing, and it's one of the two most extreme parts of making a coin. It begins with a fire bath, so anyone nearby should make sure to keep a healthy distance. The annealing furnace heats the coins up to a staggering 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, and yet they come out without a scratch on them. The coins go through this and look none the worse for wear because the annealing furnace has no oxygen inside it. Since there's no oxygen in there, the flames are carefully controlled, which prevents the coins from getting tarnished. But they're still not hot enough to melt most things they come in contact with. That's why these heated discs have to get a special water treatment immediately. This water is special for a reason. Water is only the base. Otherwise, the coins wouldn't look anything like the coins in millions of hands every second. Worse, they'd be stuck together permanently. That's why there are two other substances mixed in. The first is citric acid. This material comes from citrus fruits like oranges or pineapples. But unfortunately, there's none of those to be found in the mint. The acid is already in powdered form by the time it gets there, and it loosens the dirt and grime on the coins, giving them that mint-fresh feel when they're done. But that's not all it's for. The citric acid has a second function, especially for the penny. Since this coin is made of zinc with 2.5% copper on top, the acid removes copper oxide without dissolving the material itself. The result? That shiny penny that everyone knows, at least when it's fresh from the mint. No guarantees after it's been in use for a while. In the here and now, there are also lubricants in the water to prevent the coins from getting stuck together when the heat from the furnace is quenched. Now that they're no longer hot, the coins are ready to be washed. But there are two U.S. Mint facilities, and each one has a unique way of doing this. If you stop by the Denver Mint, you'd see this huge scoop called a skip basket. It lifts the coins out of the slippery water and into the washing area. In Philadelphia, you see this whirl-away machine slowly turning around instead, but it has the same result. The coins now go through the washing area where they're sent through this machine that restores the original color with a mixture of detergents and anti-tarnish agents. Once they're dried, it's time for the upsetting mill to get ready. Remember that part where the blank coins weren't in their finished size yet? That's what the upsetting process is all about. The coins now get sent into a groove that's slightly narrower than the current diameter. That's how the metal around the edge gets raised just a little to form a rim. And this isn't just for decoration. If something goes wrong and that rim isn't there, the coins won't be able to finish their journey. The coins leave the rim, 
and the mint workers have planchettes before them, hopefully. This is one of the most important parts of their job. Most of the coins the mint buys look like this, and they need to be inspected carefully to make sure that the rim is there and they're of the correct size specifications. This is the first line of defense against counterfeiting. An increasing number of counterfeit coins are being seized at American ports of entry as criminals hope to take advantage of amateur investors on the internet. A huge haul of $1.64 million in counterfeit coins and cash was found in Chicago in 2020 alone. If there aren't rigorous design standards in place, the Mint would practically invite counterfeiters to seize the day. If everything is fine, wannabe pennies will be ready for the next phase right away they get sent through this funnel. The other coins go through yet another cleaning process called burnishing. Workers place them in a drum with more cleaning agents and small metal pellets to make the surface smooth and polished. They're treated so lovingly that the mint's employees rinse and hand dry them with towels. That gentle touch won't last long though. It's time for striking. The planchettes now come here to this striking machine which will give the still blank coins the design that everyone knows so well. This is the other of the two most dramatic parts of the journey. The machine imprints both the heads and tail designs onto the coin at the same time, and it does so with enormous pressure. The familiar circulating coins get put through pressures ranging from 35 to 100 metric tons, depending on the denomination. But the press isn't limited to that. Collectibles like these America the Beautiful 5-ounce silver coins get to feel the force of a staggering 540 metric tons. The common coins are struck once in this press, so are less common coins like half dollars and dollars. Proof coins like these American Eagles are struck at least two times. And there's a lot of this happening at once, because 750 coins can be struck in this way every minute. There are 63 presses in the Philadelphia Mint and another 54 in Denver. That means if you're in Philadelphia, 47,250 coins per minute are coming out of its presses working at full capacity, while Denver makes a slightly more modest 40,500. And wait, there's more. Each of the striking machines have solid metal collars that the planchettes fit into. The fit is made snug thanks to that slightly raised rim we saw earlier on the tour. This little attachment is a vital part of the process. Without this tool, the planchette would expand and flatten like a pancake under such enormous pressure. Before collars came around in 1828, coins were wider, which was a problem if you wanted to carry a lot of them around. You can thank the collar for making coins at least a little more convenient today. But the coin's metallic alloy didn't get watered down as they slim. The collars allowed them to get thicker, which is why those dimes and quarters you're carrying can be 8.33% nickel with the remainder of copper. It's been a very busy day, but at least the Mint's employees get to see these piles of finished coins roll off the conveyor belt and into a bin. Inspectors will look at them every so often to make sure there's no mistake in the struck design. If there is, this particular batch will get sent to coin purgatory, this machine called a waffler. The waffler bends the coins, making them look a little like a waffle. The scrap gets sent for recycling and sold off, sometimes in the form of collector's curiosities. Without such careful inspections done by hand, the mint would be inviting counterfeiting again. The coins that do pass muster will be counted, weighed, and put into huge bags like this. These bags are so heavy when they're full, they can only be moved by forklift. The forklift then stacks the bags on yet more shelves, where they'll wait for the Federal Reserve to submit an order to the mint. That could be a long time away. Pennies might not be on those shelves for much longer, though, so see them when you can. Bye for now.